En teo chiva tuk ni Juan kama no tatlang mana ahuak, no toka keksala mehtisex. Ni nemi kama isko chiva skaigan kama mo tatlang Blackfoot Cree Nakota Soto e meti tlatso kamati. Bless all our relations. I'm from Anahuac. That's my motherland on Nicarao territory. I'm Mehtisex. My name is Kexala. I'm grateful to be with all of you here today in Amiskwichiwas Gaigan, the motherland and the gathering lands of the Blackfoot, the Cree, the Nakota, the Soto, and the Metis nations. I, I also want to acknowledge that we are here, every single one of us is here, and living our lives in the way that we are because those treaties, to the Treaty 6 that allows us to be on these lands, has been broken. It's been broken countless times um, from the way that we drive our cars to what fuels them, to the way that we relate to each other, to the way that we don't know how to properly pronounce Amiskwichiwas Gaigan. So, um, what am I here to talk about, aside from that? I came in and I kind of wanted to make everybody uncomfortable. And I wanted to start with that broken treaties talk because we have all come here and we've consented to share ideas. And in that consenting to share ideas, we're consenting to feel uncomfortable. We're consenting to have those things in our perceptions questioned. But I have a, not a history, but I have a low tone of voice, and it sounds aggressive to some folks. Uh, so I had to do a lot of thinking of how am I going to talk about this. And I do a lot of thinking about it all the time because I'm also a teacher and an educator. And so I'm always talking about decolonization with folks, whether it's in the streets or whether it's in front of a, of a whiteboard. I'm always bringing it up, and I have to wonder, um, how can I do this in the kindest way? So I called a good friend of mine, Ealing, this morning. Um, and they are one of the most prayerful people I know. And we met at Ocheti Shakowing, which is one of the largest camps of Standing Rock. Um, and while we were there, we got to start a decolonization class that was only for indigenous people and people of color. Um, and every other night, I taught a class that was for absolutely all of the camp. Um, and at these lessons, uh, I got to like come up with a couple of like mantras or catchphrases that people caught on to. And one of them that Ealing reminded me of today was, panic is not prayerful. So I brought that with me here. And I brought my sister with me, and we were sitting outside. We came in during the first session and it had started. And we were sitting outside. I was with my laptop. We were talking about the talks. And security came up to us and asked us if we were loitering. And like, I don't know how to tell y'all, as like uh, a displaced urban indigenous person who's displaced in someone else's urban territory, how many times that has happened to me. Um, and it was mind blowing and I didn't know how to interact with it. But then I reminded myself, panic is not prayerful. And I tried to gather my thoughts and tried to say, what am I gonna talk about today? What am I gonna bring up? How far is it gonna go? And um, it's been really hard. I'm going to be honest with y'all, starting in that way, and having what I'm going to say to y'all police today because of the uncomfortability that it brings. But it's also a tremendous opportunity for me to talk to y'all about uncomfortability and how we can deal with uncomfortability. But I'm not going to take that. Because I think that focusing still on the people who are uncomfortable about this is still recreating colonial violence. It's still recreating cis supremacy. It's still recreating uh, able supremacy. It's still recreating white supremacy. So instead, I'm going to do what I usually do when I talk my classes, is I try to weaponize everybody in there. I try to talk to them about what is colonialism, how do we interact with it, how do we engage with it, and how do we combat it within ourselves, within our families, within our communities, and how do we take that further? What is colonial violence? And it's something that is like really easy to like frame in the past. It's something that's really easy to frame as something that we don't participate in. But really, colonial violence is sitting in these seats right now and being comfortable. Colonial violence is the control of the elements that we have and being warm in this room. And like colonial violence and understanding it in that way is something that we can't all do because we all haven't had those circumstances. But we can all try and understand what colonial violence means to us and how we enact it and how we are complicit in it. Um, I started talking about uncomfortability, but I didn't talk about why it makes people uncomfortable. 
And I think that I need to do like a whole overview of colonial violence through the years to do that. Um, so let's start with what is colonialism? Uh, colonialism is a, another country uh, or nation state coming to a territory uh, with the purpose of taking the resources of that territory and appropriating them. That happens, seems like a common story, right? Like, we know how that goes. But what happens when they come to these territories is that they also bring their axiology, which is a big word for how we quantify, how we give value, and how we prescribe worth to things. So when colonizers come upon contact, they decide this is the worth of the people. This is the worth of the resources. This is the worth of the land. This is what we can pursue here. And that becomes embedded in all of the institutions that create that nation state afterwards. So when we get to post-colonialism or settler colonialism, all of our institutions, all of our policies, all of our governance structures are based off of those beliefs that were brought upon contact. And then that shapes how we how we, that shapes how we talk about epistemology, which is how we conceive knowledge and how we transfer knowledge, and what knowledge we see is valid. And we can see that in all our institutions, we see that in our education institutions and our medical institutions. How indigenous medicines are not a part of them at all, but we're getting there, but we're very slowly getting there with indigenous people having to fight and have their backs to the wall constantly. And, th and then what settler colonialism does to us is that it makes us exist within all of these institutions. It makes us have, like, even from the way that we define our address to the way that we define whether we are indigenous settlers or immigrants to the way that we interact with the healthcare and medical system, all of that shapes how we perceive reality and how we understand, every, how, we understand how everything is, basically. That's ontology. And axiology, epistemology, and ontology come together for the state to create a narrative and to create what is normal. And so, that's why it's so painful. That's why it's so painful to say to someone, hey, you just did something racist. Because that someone has like, thought in that way and not questioned themselves for their whole life. It's so painful to have these conversations where we're saying to a teacher, hey, the way you are teaching is violent to these students. Because that teacher, their whole life, might have wanted to teach students and change their lives. Might have wanted to hold those hearts in their hands and guide those students to be the best people they can be. But they're not aware that they're doing that in a violent way. So it's important that when we call out these violences, we do it in a good way. We do it in a nice way. We do it in a kind way. We do it in a loving way, like Jesse told me backstage. So, we communally constructed ways of engaging and combating colonial violence as this awesome community of a decolonial class that we had at Ochetisha going. Some days, there was five of us and we ended up just eating dinner in my tent, and some days there were 300 of us in this massive dome. For like three weeks, there was 300 of us, and I had to teach to a class screaming at the top of my lungs in a circle, um, and it was tremendous. And what we did there together is come up with five different ways of engaging and combating colonial violence. The first one is do nothing and be the best you can be. And it's valid because it's not always safe. It's not always safe for us to say, like with that security officer today, it wasn't safe for me to say, hey, it's not okay for you to ask me if I'm loitering. I'm here, I'm a speaker. <laughs> like, I'm a fancy person today. Um, <laughs> Because they had that position of power and because they could have told me, hey, you're not allowed to be here and I could have not talked. And in that, like, deciding whether it's safe for us, we also have to position ourselves. And we get to see where are we? Where am I the oppressor? Where am I the oppressed? What power do I have? Where am I disempowered? And how can I engage with this? The second one is a call out. And call outs we have to be really careful with. Because a call out, sometimes people find inherent violence in it. And a call out is where you say, hey, this is what you did. This is how it made me feel. This is why it's problematic. Maybe tied to some systematic oppression. And then you ask for the response. What do you think? Where are we at now? How do we go forward together? Or you can just walk away if you need to. It depends on how safe you are. But again, with this call-out culture, we can get aggressive with each other. And we need to make sure that we keep everybody safe and the intended community that we're trying to keep safe, safe. An example of this is when white folks go willy-nilly calling other white folks racist. 
Also, if you prefer the, the term people without color, I use, like to use that one since I've divested from whiteness too. Um, but when white folks say to another white person, hey, you're being racist, that other white person isn't going to think this white person's the worst. They're very likely going to think my community is being divided and attacked again. So keep that in mind when you're talking to people and you're calling them out. The next option is call someone in. Build a relationship with them based on what you're saying to them. Tell them, I learned this. From my experience, I know this. I too was you, young Padawan. And I too hurt people's feelings. I've never seen a Star Wars movie in my life. I'm so proud for that <laughs> reference. Um, and then the fourth one is ask for time. Whether you're being called out or whether you are calling someone out, it's totally OK for you to ask for time to process, to internalize, to understand what's going on so that you can come back in the best way possible. So other than this is bringing it home. So when you learn, when you have a relationship with someone where you have to call them out, bring that with you where you go. Learn from that. Did it go well? Did it go badly? How can you give people tools to engage with this in a good way too? I started this talk by talking about how panic is not prayerful and how we need to approach things in peaceful and loving ways. But I recognize that unless we don't know what to do, panic is our only response. So I hope that I've weaponized you in some way against colonial violence. I hope I've inspired you to love yourself and be yourself because you're the change. Um, and if you live here, I work on decolonial stuff all the time. So please, let's create some community together and work together. Uh, that's what I'm at the.